Hello and welcome guys. In this series we are doing the uh, initiate part, past year questions and in this session we are going to do ENT questions. Now as you know that ENT in initiate are they don't ask you too many questions and therefore I'm doing, going to keep this session very short, crisp and only the important points. I'm not going to take too much of your times because as you know as I understand that you have to study so many subjects so you don't have too much time for each subject. So I'll give it very short and crisp. So we'll talk about, start with the questions from November 2022. Now most of the questions that I've seen uh, that have been asked in the past few years, they were simple questions, some very direct questions also. So it shouldn't be a big problem and we can finish some of them very fast also. Few were conceptual questions. So I'm going to take a little bit time in these questions the ones which are really conceptual. But the first one is a simple question. It's not a dif difficult question. Uh, type of tympanoplasty, what is done in which type? So on there are two columns, obviously, and you match the two columns. In the first column, there is type one, type two, type three, type four tympanoplasties. And in the second column, what is done? Like place the graph on the incurs. Two is saying place the graph on the round window. Third one says place the graph on the head of stapes. And the fourth one says, place the graph on the malleus. And then you have various choices, combinations. So which is the correct answer? What do you think? Very, very, very important topic. I'm sure if you remember that I keep telling this, that out of all the surgeries that we discuss in here, tympanoplasty is easily the most important surgeries that we have to know. And in the, uh, tympanoplasty, you have to know everything. Most important, the names of tympanoplasty, which I'll show you, but and what is done in which type? Total there are five types, but in this case, A is the correct answer. That means uh, type one, you place the graph over the malleus. In type two, you place the graph on the incus. In type three, you place the graph over the head of the stapes. And in type four, you place the graph over the round window and the eustachian tube. Right. Now look at this. Uh, these are the five types of tympanoplasties, and this. Classification was given by Wilston. Look at the top, and that's why it's called Wilston classification or modified Wilston classification of tympanoplasty. Now, type one is also called meringoplasty. And what is it in type one? As you can see, we place the graph of the tympanic member on the head of the malleus, the first ossicle. So when you place the graph on the first ossicle, it's type one. In type two, you have to place the graph on the second ossicle, incus. See, it matches. First ossicle, we how do you name the ossicle? Malleus incus tapis. So when you place the graph on the first ossicle, it is type 1, malleus. If you place graph on the second ossicle, it is type 2. And if you place the graph on the third ossicle, the head of stapes, type 3. So 1, 2, 3 is very easy to remember. But because there are three ossicles, what is type 4? In type 4, we place the graph over the round window and the station tube. But type 5 is a very different kind of tympanoplasty. What is done in this? In this, we create a fenestra or a fistula on the lateral semicircular canal. So this is another very commonly asked type of tympanoplasty that what is done in type 5. Here you create a fistula or a fenestra on the lateral semicircular canal. Now the first four types are very common surgeries. We still do them commonly. But last one is not done nowadays very commonly. Although in theory you have to know this, but it is not done. You know why? See, whenever you do surgery, we have to weigh the advantage. Every surgery has some drawbacks or disadvantages or complications, you can say, isn't it? And we do the surgery because they have the inherent advantages. So before any surgery, we weigh the advantage and disadvantage. If the advantages are more than the disadvantages, then we go ahead and do the surgery. If the advantages are less than the disadvantages, that means they are profound disadvantages or complications, then we do not do that surgery. That's a very logical thing. In type 5, this is the problem. It is a very big disadvantage. What is the big disadvantage? The patient begins to have vertigo. Now, I'm sure you understand that vertigo is a very serious problem or a uh, symptom. It can make life miserable. And that's why you cannot do a surgery where the patient begins to have vertigo. And that's why we don't do type 5 tympanoplasty. But they can ask a question that you have done a tympanoplasty uh, surgery in a patient of uh, CSUM. And post-surgery, the patient begins to complain of vertigo. So which type tympanoplasty have you done? So obviously then the answer becomes type 5 because this is the one that causes vertigo. 
right and these are some of the images showing you how type 1c if you look at the graph is on the head of the malleus in the second one the graph and the prosthesis on the head of the step is so this is type 3 that's how sometimes they can show you images like this and they can ask you questions also based on this what type of nymphoplasty is this right so this was our question number one and then we go to the next question uh, which is a very very important mcq uh, similar question has been asked two or three times in the past very very similar question so i have taken only one out of those a uh, few questions because i'm going to explain a lot of things here so this tells tells you that which test will you combine when oae is absent in the patient auto acoustic emission is absent in the patient which test will you combine pure tone audiometry tympanometry free field audiometry a speech audiometry and you have to uh, uh, options all the four a says 1, 2, 3, 4, second choice is 2, 3, 4, third choice is 1, 2, 3, and fourth choice is 3rd and 4th. Now, this is a very interesting question. So, I want to uh, explain to you something about this. Uh, because uh, in the last 3 or 4, uh, post-COVID, I'll say that every exam, whether it is NEET PG, MCI, that foreign medical uh, screening test, or this INISET, they've constantly asked questions on this hearing test especially tuning for audiometry, tympanometry. Before that, they used to ask very simple basic questions and now they've been starting, uh, they have started asking questions which are slightly more conceptual. So I want to spend some time with you to explain the basics of hearing uh, test so that if they ask you similar questions, you can answer. If they ask different questions on a similar pattern, you can answer them. Because like I said, these are slightly conceptual things. So I want you 100% attention for the next 10 minutes. Absolutely. Just leave everything aside, just focus, this is going to be very, very useful, I'm telling you, just, now, we'll, I'll tell you the answer, but before that, what is the aim of any, any hearing test? You know the names of the hearing test, I'll tell you the names. The basic aims of the hearing test are four. One of them is to know whether hearing loss is present or not. If the patient is normal hearing or has a hearing loss, that's the basic thing. Now, if there is a hearing loss, how much? The, uh, the severity, the degree of hearing loss, is it mild, moderate, severe, profound? You know, there are various degrees. And then you have to know what is the type of hearing loss. There are two main types, conductive hearing loss and sensorineural. And sensorineural is further divided into cochlear and retrocochlear. And fourth is related to the third one, the site of the lesion, which part of the auditory pathway causes the hearing loss. This is related to the th uh, third point. Depending on the site of the damage, the hearing loss is either conductive or sensorineural, cochlear or retrocochlear. It's based on that. Right. Now, hearing test I can divide basically into two broad categories. One is the subjective type of investigations and the other is objective types of investigation. What is the difference between subjective and objective? Subjective investigations are one where the patient has to cooperate. You give a sound stimulus and you ask the patient or the patient has to respond to you. And this can only be done in the patient who is capable of responding. Because the patient has to respond. Right? So the patient should be capable of responding. That means it can only be done in a cooperative patient. A patient who can cooperate. Like uh, an uh, adult person, mentally sane, not sleeping, not, uh, not under coma and willing to get it done. They, they are looking forward to the test. Right? If a patient is uncooperative, a small child, newborns, cannot do this test. A patient who is sleeping, a patient under coma, Patient mentally challenged, cannot, you know, cannot understand. Or patient who is not willing to get it done. They don't want to get it done. You can't force them. In all these patients, you cannot do a subjective test. So in this patient where you cannot do subjective test, you can do the objective, the second category. Now, objective are mainly, they are all computerized tests. You just have to put a probe and the computer, you switch on the computer and you get a graph and you have to interpret the graph. Whether the patient is sleeping under coma, patient is child, you can do objective in all them. Right. Now look at the important subjective test, tuning fork test, pure tone audiometry, behavioral audiometry, distraction audiometry, conditioning test. Now these three, they come under the heading of free field audiometry. If I use the word free field audiometry, then these are the three types, free field and then the speech audiometry also. Under speech audiometry, there are two basic uh, subtypes. One is called speech reception threshold, SRT, and the second is called speech discrimination, SD. Now, this last one is partly subjective, partly objective also. Then, which are the objective ones? Impedance audiometry, very, very important. Impedance audiometry, very commonly done. And with impedance audiometry, you can do two tests. You can do tympanometry, you can do a 
a caustic reflex. Both can be done with this. Then auto caustic machine. The question is about this auto caustic machine. Then Bera electrocochleography and auditory steady response, steady state response (ASSR). Right. Now the first three are important out of this lot. Now, electrocochleography is, is an objective type of investigation for hearing, but the main uh, purpose or the indication for this is to make a diagnosis of Meniere's disease. Only done for Meniere's disease diagnosis. So, uh, it's not used for any other test. So, we are not going to discuss this one. And so is ASSR. ASSR is not very commonly done in India, over the world, because BERA and OEA are much better than ASSR. So ASSR, the name should be there. You should know that ASSR is a type of, type of investigation for hearing and the fact that it is an objective type of investigation, that much you must know, but you don't have to know the details of this. The rest of them, of course, you have to know the details. Of course, in this session, we are not going to go into the details. For details, you have to look at the eGoogle app because everything is discussed in that in great detail. Now, so hearing test can be divided into two categories and then again in... Uh, Newborns and infants and children, we do different type of tests because in this case, you cannot do subjective investigations, right? So you have to do objective ones. But in adults, you can do subjective, objective, uh, anything that you want to do. And we go for the easiest one, the simplest one, which can give you all the information that you need. But it should be a simple, not very costly, easily done. We always prefer those tests, right? Uh, now, to know the hearing loss, remember I told you there are four aims of the or any hearing test to know whether the patient is hearing loss or not, normal or not, then the severity of hearing loss, then the type of hearing loss, CHL, SNHL, cochlear, cochlear, and the site of hearing loss. So for the first two things, if you want to know the, just this is a very basic information you need. When the patient comes and tells you I have a hearing loss, I feel I can't hear from my right ear or left ear, then the basic thing you want to know is, is the patient feeling correct? Is the patient actually not hearing or is just an in a perception? And if the patient has a hearing loss, how much? Is it mild, moderate, severe, profound? So this basic information you can get from these investigations. Pure tonodimetry, acoustic reflex, autoacoustic emission, BERA and free field audiometry. I told you free field audiometry has three subtypes. I just told you in that case you can do a conditioning test, a distraction test, a type of tests, isn't it? Now. Most common test that we do for this basic information is pure tone audiometry, the first one. And that's why from pure tone audiometry, they ask you a lot of questions. And this is done in a lot of patients because a lot of complaints of hearing loss. Now, pure tone audiometry is a subject investigation, but it gives you all the information that you need about hearing loss. Simple test can be done in any clinic as a basic instrument. It's not a very costly test. So, patient is very willing to get it done. Right? So, in adult for hearing loss, this is the first test and sometimes the only test we do. We don't have to do any other thing. But in uncooperative patient, you cannot do this. Like in children, in mentally challenged patients, you know, all that example that I gave you. In those cases, you cannot do this test. And in those cases, you can do rest of them. You can do these four tests in children. In adult, you can do all of them. But we prefer the first one. Why? Because it has inherent advantages, like I told you. Easy, simple, cheap, and gives you all the information that you need. In Uncooperative patient like children, you cannot do the first one, so you can go for any of the four. Now, in the past, we used to do three field audiometry, and there are three subtypes. Again, I tell you, when we did not have these facilities, these are relatively new investigation, relatively, because they are highly advanced technique. They are all computerized kind of a investigation. I told you that's why they are objective. So before these were invented, we used to do free field audiometry. In free field audiometry, what is done? The child will not, if you give a sound to the child, small child, one year old child, the child will not say, I can hear or cannot hear. So you look at the response of the patient. One of them is startled reflex, you know. When you give a loud sound, somebody gets startled. So you'll get startled only if you can hear the sound. Otherwise, you'll not. A lot of pranks nowadays, you're walking on the road in the garden, somebody comes from behind and gives you a loud sound suddenly, and then you go like that. So that, that means that's the startling. This, that's the kind of free field audiometry. Then there's a distraction test where there's some distraction in front of the patient, uh, visual distraction. Maybe the child cannot hear, but the child can see. So they, you play around that, you uh, run, children are playing some toys and all. The child gets distracted by those and then you check the hearing. I'm not going to go into the details. If you want to know the details, all this is discussing e Google app. You can just go here, everything is discussed there. Right. So free field audiometry is a 
not a very reliable indicator of hearing. At least it may give you the first information whether the patient has a hearing loss or not. But if you want to know the severity of hearing loss, this almost impossible to get with free field odometry. So it's not a good investigation. It can be done in children. It's not a good investigation for no hearing because it does not, A, it's less reliable. B, it does not give you all the information that you need. So what is the best thing in children? The best thing in children are the rest of the three. Acoustic reflex, uh, OAE, autoacoustic reflex, and BERA. So in children, we prefer these three to know about this basic information of hearing loss. And autoacoustic emission again is a little more complex thing. So we do not do this. So our main investigation in children are these two. So if I ask you a simple question that in a small child, which is the investigation that you want to, investigation of choice for hearing loss in a newborn child, in an infant, your answer should be one of these two, either autoacoustic emission or BERA. Both are almost equally correct. But uh, if you have to select one of the two, both are given choices and you are allowed to select one, then you go for OAE. Autoacoustic emission is the first test that we do in children. And so in child, what we do is we do first OAE nowadays because in the past we used to free field, not done anymore. Unless, of course, you don't have this facility, you are in a very remote area, then you can do field audiometry also. Now, OAE gives you two results. Either pass, pass means OAE is present. It's a normal thing. OAE is present, pass. That means the patient's hearing is normal. And refer. There's no fail. Refer means you're not sure. You cannot see OAE. See, OAE, this is the problem with OAE, that OAE can tell you you're normal or not. But OE cannot tell you with confirmation that you are not normal. The hearing is not normal. So you are referring. Refer means you have to do something else to confirm. So this will not confirm. And refer means I will do BERA now. So what will BERA do? BERA will confirm that there is a problem. And it will give you other information also. So BERA is definitely a better investigation than OE in children. Because A, it is confirmatory, better than OE. And it gives you more additional information also. OE gives a very basic information whether the patient hear or not. And that also has some downsides which I might discuss depending on what is in store. Uh, so my question is, if BERA, I told you in children we can do OE and BERA. I told you if you have to select one of the two, you go for OE. That is the investigation of choice in children. And I'm telling you BERA is better because it is giving you more information and better information and also confirmatory. So BERA is better. For children, why do we prefer OE over BERA as the investigation of choice? Because OE is a very simple investigation to do. So simplicity is very important, especially in children. You can't do anything in child. A newborn child, you cannot put the child into too much of problems or trouble. You want to do something very, very basic and simple where the child should not face any problem and also gives you the information that you need. And this criteria is fulfilled by OE to a large extent. Right. So I hope that you understand the basic. Now to get the other information, the site of the lesion. Now see, this is the auditory pathway that I tell you. And you know there is external ear, there is middle ear, there is inner ear, there is eighth nerve. Right. Anywhere there is a hearing loss. Now what are the investigations we do? If you want to check external ear, you can just do examination of the otoscopy. You can see the otoscopy external ear with autoscopy and you can see the disease there, make a diagnosis and you know there is hearing loss. So it gives you all the information. Basically for external ear diseases, investigations are not required. But for middle ear, we can do tympanometry. See, tympanum, middle ear is also called tympanum. Mitry of the tympanum is tympanometry. For inner ear, cochlea, we have OAE, we have electrocochleography and we have speech audiometry. I told you speech audiometry is one of the tests. And for eighth nerve disease, you can do BERA, acoustic reflex. Now acoustic reflex can be done for like uh, a cochlea also, but it's mainly done for eighth nerve and you, speech audiometry see, can be done for both. Right. So uh, these are the tests that will tell you the site of the lesion mainly. And the one before this that I use, these are the ones that tells you about the hearing loss, hackinia and the severity of hearing loss. So really what tests you pick up depends on what is your aim? What do you want to find out? Because the first thing that we always want to know hearing loss is there or not. That's why we do the basic test most commonly. Now, I told you that in adult, I always do pure tone audiometry first because that's the simplest thing. It gives you all the information. What the information gives me? It tells you the threshold of hearing loss, of hearing, 
and based on threshold you can know the patient is normal or has hearing loss this is the information you get but uh, you can do it can tell you it is chl or snhl also it can tell you the type of hearing loss so it gives you a lot of information this is the only information that you need and that's why in most cases like i said pure tone audiometry is sufficient then if it is chl where is the disease in chl the disease lies in the middle ear mainly so you have to find out about middle ear more information and then you do tympanometry remember in the last previous slide i told you for middle ear disease we do tympanometry so tympanometry will give you the additional information so when you do pta pure tone audiometry and you find out it is chl middle ear disease you do tympanometry also then you get almost all the information that you need about this patient's hearing but if it turns out to be snhl snhl means either inner ear which is cochlea or eighth nerve disease in this case you cannot do tympanometry then we do either oe or bera or acoustic reflex or speech audiometry depending on your your comfort level and what other type of information you need you can do any of them or all of them or any combination of these four so they are useful only when the patient has sensory neural hearing loss so i repeat this that when you do a pure tone audiometry a you will get the threshold of hearing by that you can know whether the patient's hearing loss is there or not and you can know the severity of hearing you know the basic information and it can also tell you is it chl or snhl if it is chl you may have to do tympanometry Uh, to know more information but if it is snhl then you have to do bera autocostal mission speech audiometry and acoustic reflex to get more information so depends on what you need in children however we go slightly differently i told you uh, in the past we used to do free field audiometry but it's an outdated test because the rest of the tests are much more advanced they give you better information so we are not doing this test anymore right so you can do any of these three and i told you this is the investigation of choice and bera is the second investigation that we prefer but you can do tympanometry and acoustic reflex also if you wish to you always have this options with you now this question so this is the basic of how you should approach a patient uh, when you want to know about hearing based on the child or adult this is the basic that i wanted to tell you and then this question was based on auto acoustic emission now auto acoustic emission is a emission that is produced by the outer hairs so this is very important it produced by the outer hairs of the cochlea so this is a cochlea right now then it travels from the outer hairs to the basilar membrane then it goes to the oral window then middle ear ocular chain and then comes out of the external ear so this is a emission auto acoustic emission means what emission means energy wave energy so this wave energy that is producing the outer hairs of the cochlea it is coming out so because the energy is coming out we put a probe in the external ear we catch this emission and that helps us know there's a uh, there's a problem or not right so it is this part of the cochlear implant uh, auto acoustic mission is in relation to the cochlea this is a part of the cochlea and all this is middle ear because this is where the sound or the mission passes through it passes through the cochlea and the middle ear to come to the external ear where you can use the investigation to find out there is a problem or not now what i'm trying to say is if i use this diagram once again that i see this is the external ear right this is tympanic membrane this is middle ear and this is inner ear cochlea there's a eighth nerve which i'm not interested in. now your auto acoustic emission is produced here right now if cochlea is normal the auto acoustic emission will be normal it will be present if the cochlea is damaged there will be no emission so if you do oae and if you can you can get the oe in the instrument it shows that the oe is present it means it was present auto acoustic emission was produced by the cochlea that means cochlea is normal and that's why you got the result but if it is absent oe is absent then what is your interpretation that means it was not produced by the hair cells that means there is a disease in the cochlea isn't it right now that's the most likely situation that you produce you, the oe was absent that means the cochlea is not producing the oe so there is a cochlear disease but there is another scenario also maybe the oe was produced by the cochlea cochlea is normal but your middle ear is diseased 
Right? The middle ear is diseased the, because OE has to travel outward, isn't it? This emission has to go out. Only then you know you use the instrument in the external ear to catch this reflex, these uh, emissions. So if it, it is produced but cannot travel, the rasta kharab hai, to bhi nahi aega. So if the O is absent, it may be inner ear disease, it may be middle ear disease also. Middle ear disease also can cause absence of OE. That's why absence of OE is not confirmatory of inner ear disease. That's why when OE is absent, we refer, we go, we do better. We never say inner ear disease because of this reason. Because OE, to catch the OE, we need the normal functioning of the middle ear also. But OE is not done for middle ear. It is done for inner ear. That's why if OE is present, then everything is normal, including inner ear. But if OE is absent, inner ear may be normal may be disease. If it is diseased or normal, if it is normal, then you are not getting away because the middle ear problem, because it is not able to travel. And that is why you have to do better now to uh, know the complete information. That is why when the OA is absent, it is called refer. It is not called absent, it is called refer. Right. Now, what is the aim of OE? There are two aims of OE. One is screening of hearing loss in children. This is what I told you. When the child, you are suspecting a hearing loss, you cannot do pure tone audiometry, we do OE. In adult, if you have to do screening of hearing loss, then we can do pure tone audiometry because it is a, object, a subjective investigation and adult can respond to the sound of the audiogram. But there is second use also to differentiate cochlear disease versus retrocochlear disease. Is the disease of the cochlea or the eighth nerve, this also OE can tell you. These are the uses of OE. Let us come back to the, our question. The question says, if the test, which test will you combine when the OA is absent? Now, if the, you know, when I first read this question, the first impression I got is that O is absent means the facility of O is absent in the hospital. Your hospital does not have the O E. Which other test can you do? I told you if O is absent because O is about cochlea, inner ear. So you can do bara, you can do free field audiometry also. But that that's one of the interpretations. But we are assuming now that O is absent means there is no energy. O is energy is absent. Facility is there but it is not showing OE. So if O is absent, you have to refer, isn't it? Refer for Bera. So this is your best answer. If I ask you, if I give you this question that which test will you combine when the OE is absent in the patient, you will say Bera is the investigation that I will combine if O is absent because this is what I told you, isn't it? But there is no Bera in the choices. So what? Now, Pure tone audiometry is useless because if you are doing OE, you have already either you have already done PTA if it is adult and if it is a child, you cannot do a PTA. Now, rest of the three, what about free field audiometry? I told you you can do any of the three, right? Now, free field audiometry is a very, very basic in investigations. If you are already doing OE, that means you already advanced your hospital, your setup is already advanced. Why will you do a very primitive test, which is outdated? That's why with OE, we'll never combine this. We'll never combine this. It's a primitive test. So you can, now if Bera is absent, there are two things that might have happened. Either it is a middle ear disease, I want to know, or it is inner ear disease, cochlear disease. For middle ear disease, I told you, we do tympanometry. And for inner ear, if you don't have the facility of Bera, OAE and other things, you can go for speech audiometry. So these are the two tests that can be combined with OAE if Bera is absent. This is, we are assuming Bera is absent. It was not given the choices. So your answer becomes D. 2 and 4. Tympanometry and speech audiometry are the tests that you can combine with audiometry uh, with the uh, auto acoustic emission uh, to get more information if it is absent. If, if it is present, then you don't have to do anything. The best answer would have been Bera. If Bera is not given in the choices, then these are the two things you can combine to get further information. So I just spent few minutes with you with this uh, uh, very basics of hearing test. It might have been slightly confusing if you have not, you were reading this for the first time. But I will suggest that you go to your eGroople app, read about this properly. You will get a better understanding of this. And then you come back and watch this part of the uh, video that we are discussing. 
and I'm pretty sure they're going to ask many more questions based on this similar kind of things and that's why I will suggest that you uh, tell your friends your junior your senior colleagues to watch this part of the video must because it will give you a lot of insight into hearing tests that we do for children and adult look at the next question is very similar if O is not available which other screen test can be done it's a very similar question isn't it and this was asked also in the same paper in the same year actually different paper but same year so the same year may and november they asked the same almost the same question this is slightly simple that was slightly difficult question so you know if o is not available i just told you what is the screen test you can do it's a very straightforward question we'll do bera i told you so many times refer isn't it you can do either oe or bera in a child for screening test so this was straightforward we have discussed this next one all of the following are smell perception test except uh, the first three are smell perception test the second eye test is not a perception test what type of test is this this is a test for mucociliary clearance i'll explain to you this but before that now for smell perception test we have a long list of tests you can just take these names if you wish to uh, this was the first time they'd ask such question it's a very uh, i would say not a very good question uh, it's a fact-based question you just have to know these names one of the choices was uh, oopsit smell test in that list and uh, this name uh, cross culture is a sub type of oopsit it's also type of oopsit and these are called sticks smell sticks dick sets are sticks so if you look at these uh, uh, sticks smell sticks these are dick sets right they've used different name for so i don't uh, expect them to ask these questions again but there are few names if you want to remember oopsit cross culture tests dip sets sticks smell tests and all things things you can remember the other one is actually more important uh, muco these are the this is how small smell dick sets look like now mucociliary clearance tests are more important compared to smell perception test uh, what is the meaning of mucociliary clearance the mucus of the nose what is producing the sinus comes into the nose and there's a mucus produced in the nose and they all have to be cleared from the nose there are two ways of clearing either they can come out from the nose which is not a nice thing so it doesn't happen that all the mucus uh, mucus from the nose goes backward what is behind the nose nasopharynx so there is a cilia in the nose and they push this mucus of the nose backward into the nasopharynx and through the nasopharynx it goes down and it goes to the stomach that's how it cleared so sometimes this uh, clearance is not uh, normal either because of ciliary motility defect or anatomical defect some obstruction some growth so you have to know whether the mucus clearance is normal or not that's th there are many tests in that and these are called mucociliary tests you can see the first name was given in that choice saccharin test where you place a saccharin cube it's like a sugar in the nose and this will travel backward and when it goes to the nasopharynx and oropharynx patient gets the taste of that so when the patient gets the taste you know it has cleared from the nose to the nasopharynx and you can note the town time time is more important how much time it took to it should take ideally 20 to 25 minutes when you place the sugar cube and the patient gets the taste in the throat uh, that time gap should be 20 to 25 minutes that's a normal time if it's more than that that means there's a problem in clearance but you don't have to know if uh, then second thing you can use uh, dye instead of uh, paste now when the patient will tell you the taste it's a subjective thing you are depending on the patient right patient may lie to you again subjective test can be done only for patient who want to get it done i told you so you can do an objective type where you can either put some dye like whichever dye charcoal is also used and you can use various violet ink and all that so when this dye you place in the nose it will travel backwards and when close the pharynx the pharynx gets stained with the dye so you can ask the patient to open the mouth you can see the stain in the oropharynx and then you know the dye is raised back so the clearance has taken place and again you can note the time now a lot of radio uh, labeled isotopes are used nowadays so radio you can see rhino uh, scintometry these are technetium labeled uh, particles are used radio opaque teflons are used combined dye with saccharin can be used and charcoal like can be used there's many dyes and radio labeled 
uh, resins used nowadays for the same test. But the basic purpose is the same. Is the clearance normal or not? And how much time it takes to clear? Is it within normal range or more or less? So this kind of information you can get from what is called mucociliary clearance test. So many names are there, right? Uh, then basic. Now all the questions are very simple. Like it was a very similar dissection image of a face and that point at this uh, structure which is a sphenoid sinus as we know and it opens in which meatus. It's a very simple question. Everybody knows the ostia of the sphenoid opens in the what? Sphenoid model recess which is also called supreme meatus. The other name is supreme meatus. I'm sure you know this. Very straightforward. I think everybody got it right when it was asked. Uh, this is the uh, table that's telling you which meatus contains what. So sphenoid model recess I told you is the ostia, the sphenoid sinus. Superior meatus contains the posterior ethmoidal ostia. Middle meatus is very commonly asked because there are three ostias. This is the most common MCQ otherwise from this. And inferior meatus does not have an ostia. It has something else called nasolacrimal duct. I think uh, everybody knows this. It's a very basic information, right? So let's go to the next one. A patient came with nasal deformity on examination. There was a septal perforation, most likely diagnosis. Now, this was a bad question actually. Because all the conditions given in the choices, they can cause septal perforation. And if the perforation is very severe and large, they can lead to nasal deformity. The least likely disease or the least which can cause perforation is the first one. Wagner's granuloma is very unlikely to cause perforation. It causes, the name tells you, this, it is a granulomatous disease. It causes granuloma in the nose and the oral cavity, gums and all that. Perforation in Wagner's granuloma is very, very uncommon but possible it is possible so uh, rest of the three are common causes there's something very special about syphilis that syphilis is the only infective cause of bony perforation bony part of the septum gets perforated in syphilis otherwise every infection causes perforation on the cartilage part also and they can if their perforation is very large they can cause deformity now non-killer cell lymphoma NK lymphoma, non-killer cell lymphoma has, has various names. Now, this is a very uncommon rare disease, but this is the most serious condition where immediately there is a perforation and nasal deformity and the perforation is of a very uh, severe degree and the deformity is also severe deformity uh, degree. Now, because we have to pick one of the four conditions, I will go for the one which is always going to cause a perforation. If you have NK lymphoma, 100% of the patient will have perforation and deformity. The rest of the three, very unlikely. They are very less common cause of perforation. Even if you have tuberculosis of the nose or syphilis, the chance of perforation is not very high. Deformity is not very high. It can happen. They are causes, they are causes of perforation and deformity, but they are not going to lead to perforation and deformity very commonly. But NK lymphoma, always. Always. So that's why out of the three, our answer will be non-killer cell lymphoma. Uh, which has various names like I told you it's called T-cell lymphoma and non healing lymphoma. Many names it has midline lymphomas and it's a very serious condition and prognosis is very poor in this patient. So this is our correct answer and these are the causes of septal perforations. See NK lymphoma is definitely a cause. Then see granulomatous disease can cause like Wengen granuloma, uh, syphilis, tuberculosis all these names are like I told you these are the conditions that can cause septal perforation. You can have granulomatous diseases, you can syphilis, tuberculosis, and all the four were in the choices. That's why I said all the possible potential correct answer. But we have to go to the one which is most likely to cause perforation and deformity. In that, we have NK lymphomas. Right. And this is how the patient looks like with uh, NK lymphoma. You see, it's midline. The nose gets involved. And in the palate, you can see there's a perforation in the palate also. So nose, pen, whole this area gets, that's why it's called midline non-healing lymphoma. The whole area gets damaged, necrosed and things like that. So very bad disease like I said. But we'll go to the next one, which says a foreign body enters in the laryngeal intellect, uh, prevented by cough, not prevented by cough reflex basically, reflex is sluggish in alcoholic ingestion and some other conditions. Which nerve is likely to be injured? Basically the only complaint is aspiration, there's a foreign body in the larynx and there is a sluggish cough reflex. So which laryngeal nerve is damaged? Is it internal, external laryngeal nerve, 
or internal laryngeal nerve or superior laryngeal nerve or glossopharyngeal nerve. So what is the correct answer? If aspirations only complain, the only nerve that is likely to be damaged is the internal laryngeal nerve. Because this is the this nerve has only one function. The only function of internal laryngeal nerve is to prevent aspiration. And if aspirations only complain loss of cough reflex, then this is the nerve that is involved. Now, uh, see, larynx is divided by vagus, as you can see here. And vagus supplies the larynx via two branches. There is a superior laryngeal nerve, there is a recurrent laryngeal nerve. Superior again divided into two, external laryngeal nerve, internal. And recurrent does not divide so clear cut, so it remains recurrent. Eventually in the larynx we have three nerves. Internal laryngeal, which is purely sensory. External laryngeal, which is supplies only one muscle, cricothyroid, the main tensor. And recurrent supplies everything else. All of the muscles, so it's the main adductors and abductors. So recurrent is the one that is responsible for voice production and proper breathing. Right. So if these nerves are damaged, so if internal is damaged, the only complaint will be aspiration, the main complaint, as you can see. If your external is gone, the main complaint is low pitch voice and loose vocal cords. But if the recurrent is gone, either there is hoarseness of voice or dyspnea, one of the three. Either hoarseness of voice or difficulty in breathing. Now, depending on which is the main symptom given, you can pick the nerve. In this particular question, what was the, uh, what was the only complaint? Aspiration is the only complaint. Isn't it? So, if aspiration is the only complaint, then the only nerve that is possible is the internal laryngeal. If you had these two symptoms combined, then the nerve is superior. In superior nerve, along with aspiration, the patient will also have low pitch voice and loose vocal cord. Isn't it? When the superior is gone, this will not function, this will not function. So both the symptoms will be there. Right. And this is the diagram showing you the larynx with the nerves. Now you can see this is the superior laryngeal nerve. And you can see when it comes down, divides into two, one goes inside. This is the internal laryngeal nerve. This causes aspiration. And this one is the external laryngeal nerve. It remains outside, so it is external. Supplies the muscle in that area, cricothyroid muscle. And this one is a recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's coming and looping around and supplies all of the muscles of the larynx. So identifying of the nerves is not so important, but the function is very, very important. I tell you, vocal cord palsy questions are so frequently asked. So frequently. What they ask you usually is they give you the symptom and you pick the nerve, like the one this is here. So the previous slide that I've shown, where which symptom is related to which nerve damage, if you can remember that particular slide, then I think vocal cord palsy will never be a problem for you. Okay? Let's go to the next question. Now, jugular foramen is damaged. It leads to what? Uh, does it cause loss of taste in the anterior tooth or tongue? Does it cause loss of sensation in the posterior one third of the tongue? Loss of sensation in the anterior tooth or tongue? Loss of taste and sensation? in the posterior one third of the tongue. So which is the best answer in this case? I think everybody knows this answer. The correct answer is loss of taste and sensation in the posterior one third of the tongue. Because both taste and sensation in the posterior one third of the tongue is supplied by the ninth nerve actually. Now jugular fossa has, this is the jugular fossa area. And what does jugular fossa have? What passes through the jugular fossa? These are the four main structures that passes through the jugular fossa, jugular vein, 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerve. So if the jugular fossa is damaged, these four things can get damaged. Right. Now, tongue, 9th nerve supplies posterior one third of tongue, both sensory as well as taste both sensory and taste. So both can be affected by this now. If you look at one of the choices that I was given was loss of sensory in the posterior one third of the tongue. That is also possible, but fourth is the best answer, better answer. It gives you more information, right? But vagus can also get damaged that can cause hoarseness of voice. Exit nerve can get damaged. Shoulder movement can be affected. All this can happen when there's a jugular uh, foramen damage. When the jugular foramen is damaged and these three nerves are damaged, which may be due to fractures, tumor in that area. This is called jugular fossa syndrome. It's called jugular fossa syndrome sometimes. Also called Vernet syndrome. Basically, these names are used when these three nerves are damaged together. If all these three nerves that pass the jugular fossa are damaged together, uh, we call it jugular fossa syndrome. If the problem is in the jugular fossa, if the problem is Anywhere, other areas, damage can, problem can also cause damage to the three nerves, 
then we call it Vernet syndrome. So you can just try and remember this name if you wish to. But one thing I will tell you that in the last few years, they've been asking question on the ninth nerve very, very regularly. If I remember correctly, there are three questions in the last two years from ninth, related to ninth, three or four questions. Once they touched the palate and they asked that there was an image of the uh, face and there was a probe at the touching the palate and they asked that what senses, which nerve sensation are you test, testing? So palate is again supplied by the ninth nerve. No? Sensory supply of the palate is ninth nerve. Now, see, this is your tongue and uh, this is the anterior one third and this is the posterior two third. So, anterior one third of the tongue, as you can see, the sensory comes from the lingual nerve, which is a branch of uh, mandibular, third division of trigeminal, and the taste comes from cauda tympani, which is a branch of fascia nerve. So, sensory and the taste are different nerves, uh, fifth and seventh. But posterior one third of the tongue, both sensory and taste are the same nerve, ninth nerve. So, if the ninth is gone, anterior two third of the tongue, everything will be normal, but the posterior one third of the tongue, both the senses are gone. Right? This is a better diagram showing you the same thing. It's just an image that I've used from a, one of the Google, and you can see every the same thing. Now, next question is again a very important question. See, I told you in the beginning that a lot of questions they've been asking about tuning fork, audiometry, tympanometry, hearing test, they've been asking questions every, every exam. So the point is, the moral of the story is, you cannot go to the exam without knowing at least these uh, hearing tests very nicely. You have to do all the hearing tests very, very nicely. Otherwise, you cannot answer these questions. If you have not done it properly, I will again suggest, go to the eGoogle app that check those uh, videos, watch them, and you'll get everything that you need to know, right? Now look at this question. It says that a patient is not able to hear properly from the left ear, given in the audiogram. And what will be the finding of Rennes and Weber's test in this patient? So you see, the red the red audiograms are for the right ear. This is the right ear audiograms, isn't it? And these blue audiograms are for the left ear. If you see right, you can see both AC and BC overlapping, and blue also both AC and BC are overlapping. Now, somewhere here is the 25 mark. So anything about 25 is normal. So this is your normal, right ear is normal. But left ear, both AC and BC are mainly below 25. So there is hearing loss. And if both AC and BC are below 25, it is sensory neural hearing loss. So this is your diagnosis. Right is normal, left is sensory neural loss. So when the, what is the finding of Rennes in normal ear? It is positive Rennes, true positive. And what is the finding of Rennes in SNHL? It is false positive. So one will be true positive, one will be false positive, but both will be positive. Positive means AC more than BC. So both will be positive Rennes, one thing. Now in SNHL Weber's goes to which side? SNL, SNHL Weber's goes to the opposite side. In this case, it will go to the opposite of the left side, on the right side. So it will go to the right side. So any choice which says both positive and Weber's going to the right side is a correct answer. Which one says this? The third one says this, both Rennes are positive and Weber's will go to the right side is the correct answer. Now, once again, this is a very basic information. If you don't know this, don't go to the exam, read it. And where do you read it or find it? Same, eGoogle app. Now, basically, I'll tell you that normal hearing graph is between 0 to 25. See, that's why I made a uh, line at 25. 0 to 25 is normal. And anything below 25 is hearing loss. So this is what it's saying, that normal hearing, the graph lies between 0 and 25 decibel, but hearing loss, it is below 25. Now what happens in CHL? As you can see, in conductive hearing loss, only AC graph will be below 25 mark. That means threshold is more than 25. This is how a normal graph looks like. See, both AC and BC are in the normal area. This is the 25 mark. And both AC and B, both right and left here, red and blue, both are in the normal area. So this is how a normal graph will look like. Nothing is below this line. Isn't it? Very easy. Now, how does CHL look like? This is how a CHL will look like. See, both right and left, AC is below 25. BC is no, this is the normal area. So both right here and left here, AC is below 25. The threshold is more than 25. This is a criteria for conductive hearing loss in both the years. So this is how a graph of conductive hearing loss will look like. But in SNHL, as you can see, 
both AC and BC graph are below 25 means threshold of both AC and BC are more than 25 and the graph of SNHL will look like this. See this is the 25 mark somewhere here. AC and BC both are below 25 in the right ear. AC and BC both are below 25 in the left ear. This is SNHL or mixed hearing loss, right? So this is very basic. We can't go in details, but if you already know something about this, this might be very helpful to recall that your information that you already have. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this, again, tympanometry. We had tuning fork, we have audiometry, now we have tympanometry. See, in the same paper, same year, they're asking questions from all the topics of hearing loss. So again, I'm repeating, please read these topics very, very carefully, otherwise you're done. A child present with hearing loss, on examination, there is a high uh, arch palate and crowding of the upper teeth. Tympanometry was done, and the image of the tympanogram is shown. Which of the following surgery may be done? Now, there are two things. One is this tympanogram. This tympanogram is B type. B type or flat tympanogram. And this is seen in serous otitis media. So when you look at this graph, you know that the patient is suffering from serous otitis media. It tells you the eye arch palate with crowding of the upper teeth. These findings are seen in what is called adenoid phases. So this patient also has adenoid phases. So patient has adenoid phases with serous otitis media. Now both these disease are due to adenoid hypertrophy. So patient has adenoid hypertrophy with serous otitis media with adenoid phases. So you have to do adenoidectomy and for serous otitis media we do grommet insertion. So any choice which says grommet insertion and adenoidectomy because adenoid hypertrophy and SOM is grommet is the correct answer and this is given the third choice C. So C says we'll do grommet insertion and adenoidectomy surgery this is the best answer right. Uh, this uh, I in, in classes we discuss this very directly so there is no problem if you have entered any class everywhere we discuss this kind of questions so it should not be. Now these are the various graphs that you see this is how does A type next is AS AS is seen in auto A is normal graph AS is autosclerosis AD is disruption of ossicle then B this is flat top flat B which is seen in serious otitis media and this is C type which is seen in the station tube blocks. So th these are the various types of tympanograms. Then we will go to different exam. Now this was an image of the larynx a CT scan, uh, axial sections and they are shown uh, carcinoma and they are what stage carcinoma is this. Now laryngeal carcinoma is staging, juvenile angiofibroma is staging, they have been asking uh, recently. So you have to know the staging of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, laryngeal carcinoma, hypopharynx carcinoma and maybe nasopharynx carcinoma. Try to read these basics and when you read the books, they look very very simple but I've made it look very easy. I'll tell you here also how laryngeal carcinoma can be made very easy. But if you look at this particular CT scan, you can see there is a thyroid cartilage. The thyroid cartilage should have been like this, right? And you see this part of the thyroid cartilage, I'm pointing, is damaged. Actually, image is like this, isn't it? So the tumor can be seen going out of the thyroid cartilage. So when the tumor is seen to be going out of the thyroid cartilage, it's very, it becomes very easy. And you can't see any uh, significant lymph node. These lymph nodes that you see look like normal lymph nodes. They don't look like significant lymph node. So uh, assuming that the carcinoma of the larynx has gone out of the thyroid cartilage and there is no lymph node and metastasis, obviously we assume there is no metastasis. So this becomes last one 4A N0 M0. This stage 4A. Stage is also 4A and it is 4A N0 M0. Now I told you that if you read your books and look at the staging, it will be scary. It's very easy actually. See so what is T1? When the tumor is confined to one subside, larynx has many subsides, supraglottis, glottis, and sub there are different subsides. Supraglottis is different, glottis is different, subglottis is different. There's, if it is confined to only supraglottis or only glottis or only subglottis, it is one subside. It is T1. Supraglottis has other, is further divided into subtypes also. Supraglottis has more subtypes also, but I'll not tell you into that. 
then if it goes to more than one subside, adjacent subside, from one it goes to the other one, any adjacent subside, it becomes T2. So one subside, T1, two subsides, T2. That's how you remember. And in T3, one of the three things has to happen. So it's easy. One subside, one. Two subsides, more than two, T2. Three, one of the three areas involved, T3. Which are the three things that should happen in T3? Either vocal cord movement is fixed, or the space is like pre, pre epiglottic space, paraglottic space. If the spaces are involved, it becomes, uh, or the cartilage of the larynx is involved, laryngeal cartilage. Till now, the tumor is confined to the mucosa of the larynx, not the cartilage. When the cartilage get involved, it is still with T3. But it is within the larynx. In these three, the tumor is within the larynx. The moment the tumor goes out of the larynx, it is T4. So, in our image, the tumor has gone out of the larynx, it is broken through the cartilage of the thyroid gone out so it has to be T4. So that was very easy actually. But T4 is divided into A and B. Right. A when it is close to larynx and B when it is away from the larynx. Now there are many areas if this is involved, this is involved to 4A. So what are the structures involved in 4A is very difficult to remember because there are many structures. So what you can remember, what are the structures that must be involved in 4B? In 4B, one of the three has to be involved, either carotid artery, uh, seat of the carotid artery, not the artery itself, encircling the carotid, or the pre-vertebral space, or the mediastinum. If the, say the point is, if the tumor is outside the larynx, involving any of these three, any one or more of these three, it is 4B, but if it is outside the larynx, and not involving any of these three, is 4A, simple. So that's the easiest way of remembering the staging of larynx cosma. Node, of course, we know, <coughs> Is same for all, almost every tumor in the head and neck. But if you read this in the textbook, this is how it looks like. So when you read this whole sentences, I'm telling you it will be next to impossible to remember. So that's why just remember this, it serves your purpose. The same thing, same thing, simplify it. And this is my job, isn't it? So D was the correct answer. We'll go to the next question, which says that given alongside is an image of the tympanic membrane with the retraction pocket, so, what great retraction pocket is this? If you look at this tympanic membrane, you can see the <coughs> malleus and you can see the incus here and you cannot, uh, it is not touching the promontory. So, when you can see that tympanic membrane is adherent to the incus, the second ossicle, but not adherent to the promontory, this is grade 2 retraction. Again, it's a very common knowledge. Uh, we always discuss in almost all our lectures about retraction pocket. And this is, <clears throat> these are the four grades. This grading was done by a person called S-A-D-E, Said. There are actually four grades mainly, but in fifth grade, there is a perforation, so that we never talk about. So, in grade one, it is retracted tympanic membrane, but not up to incus. You can add, not touching incus. But if touches the incus or step is grade 2, but not promontory. And in grade 3, it will touch the promontory. In grade 4, it becomes adherent onto the promontory. That's why it's called adhesive auditis media. It becomes adherent onto promontory. So grade 1, it is not up to incus. Grade 2, it is incus. Grade 3, promontory. Only touching grade 4, it is plastered at the end of the promontory, grade 5 there will be perforation. Easy to remember, logical also and they have asked question in the past also about this. So this is not the first time they have asked question on this. Right. Then we have uh, next question, a patient presented to emergency with acute vertigo with horizontal nystagmus, slow component is towards the left side, what is the most likely diagnosis? Now, when you have nystagmus, horizontal nystagmus, it has to be uh, lateral canal. So, posterior canal and superior canal, they usually cause vertical nystagmus or even rotatory nystagmus. This question, nystagmus is horizontal. So, posterior and superior canal are straightway ruled out. So, it has to be the lateral canal. So, labyrinth, either hyperactive or hyperactive or right side or left side. I'll explain to this to you this, but first the answer is left hypoactive. See, slow component is towards the left side, means nystagmus is to the right side. It 
in this case the nystagmus is to the right side remember this right see nystagmus has two components there is a fast component and the slow component and the fast component decides the direction of the nystagmus or you can say type of nystagmus which is opposite of slow so in this case fast is opposite of slow so if slow is left side fast is right side if slow is left right side fast is left side so in this case it says slow component on the left side that means fast on the right side this is right side and so it is right sided nystagmus so when you get right sided nystagmus right sided nystagmus can be seen either right the same side is hyperactive or opposite in this case the left is hyperactive look at here cows is the mnemonics c o w s cows where c stands for cold water and the nystagmus is opposite side but opposite side nystagmus is seen can be seen in four five situation cold water which is 30 degree or hypoactive labyrinth or when there is a destructive tumor tumor or trauma this will damage when the vestibule is damaged then you get opposite right nystagmus and same side nystagmus is seen when there is opposite warm temperature which is 44 degree or hyperactive labyrinth more active right so that's why i said either there will be hypoactive it was right sided nystagmus yes or no remember right sided nystagmus so right sided nystagmus will be seen either left is hypoactive opposite or right which is same side is hyperactive any of the two choices is a correct answer and in that question this was not in the choice this was the choice given so this is a correct answer okay so it's a really nice question tricky question they did not use the word nystagmus so a lot of people think when they say slow component to the left side means nystagmus is to the left side no nystagmus is always opposite to the slow component so if slow is on the left side it is right side in nystagmus and if slow is on the right side it is left side in nystagmus so in this particular question it was right side in nystagmus so either right should be hyperactive or left should be hypoactive any of the two okay easy very basic next question again this question has been asked two or three times in the last two three years it's a very simple question just factually you have to just remember the auditory pathway <clears throat> so you have to arrange in the ascending order in this case and there are four choices cochlear nucleus superior nucleus middle geniculate and inferior colliculi and in this the correct sequence is a b c d first the sound goes to the cochlear nucleus then it goes to superior olivary nucleus then it goes to inferior colliculi and finally it goes to medial geniculate ganglia okay again that uh, e coli is the mnemonics e coli is the mnemonics most of you know this is given in a lot of books also in the classes also we discuss so if you attend any class you will know this now this is the pathway see the sound goes from the external ear to the middle ear to the cochlea then one choice was this one second choice was this one then this was the third choice in that this was the fourth choice so this this from here it goes to this one and then from here it goes to this one these were the choices given in your question and e coli my is the e stand for eighth nerve c stand for cochlear nucleus o stand for olivary nucleus l stand for lateral lemniscus i stand for inferior colloquy m is medial a is auditory cortex so if you can remember e coli my you can remember this a mnemonics then we go to 21 next year previous year basically then this year we had less questions from ENT so in a patient post of total laryngectomy all of the uh, below is advised except polite yawning supraglottic swallowing tracheoesophageal prosthesis and esophagoscopy esophageal speech now laryngectomy we divide into two types total as the name tells you we remove the entire larynx or partial which is sometimes called conservative laryngectomy you do not remove the entire larynx you only remove the disease part you retain the healthy part in the past total laryngectomy should be done 
it's the best surgery. If you do total, remove the entire earrings, there's no chance of disease remaining behind accidentally also. There's no chance of recurrence, residual disease, best. But total laryngectomy has a lot of problems. The main problem total laryngectomy is no larynx, no speech. You can't speak. Now, although your, uh, uh, your uh, auditory, uh, your olfactory epithelium is normal, but when you do a total laryngectomy, the patient cannot breathe through the nose. The patient has to be, has to breathe from tracheostome. There will be a tracheostome. So, since the patient is not breathing from the nose, the patient uh, cannot get the sense of smell. For that smell, we do what is called polite yawning. So, what we do in this case is, the, there is no larynx. So, we ask the patient to swallow from the mouth. So, when you swallow also, it, it creates negative pressure. So, that act of swallowing pulls the air from the nose. So, when the patient swallows, the air flows to the nose. The air goes to the stomach because larynx is not there. So it's, it's not, the air that you are swallowing will not go to the larynx, it will go to the stomach, but it will pass through the nose. When the air passes through the nose, you get the sense of smell. So, that is the whole idea of polite yawning. The patient can get the sense of smell in a patient of total laryngectomy. And because there is no larynx, there is no speech, so in many of these patients, we do what is called speech rehabilitation or voice rehabilitation. For voice rehabilitation, both these are methods. You can do tracheocephalic prosthesis. This was a question asked in the neat piece exam in the last neat piece exam. There was a question on this. Or you can do speech, uh, speech, uh, esophageal speech can be given. Both any of the two can be done. Tracheoesophageal prosthesis is better compared to speech. There's another thing called electrolarynx. This can also be used for speech rehabilitation. So any of the three can be used in a total laryngectomy. Now, Total laryngectomy cannot do, it will never cause aspiration. Aspiration can never happen. In fact, total laryngectomy is a treatment of aspiration. But if you do partial laryngectomy, either vertical partial or horizontal partial. Now, what is the main problem with horizontal partial? If you do horizontal partial laryngectomy, it means you are removing only the supraglottis. And this causes aspiration. So, in horizontal partial laryngectomy, Aspiration is the main problem. So every time the patient swallows the food, the patient begins to have aspiration. To prevent this, we train the patient with what is called supraglottic swallowing. So supraglottic swallowing is not done for total laryngectomy. It is done for horizontal laryngectomy. The question is about total laryngectomy, which of the following is not done. So supraglottic swallowing. So B is your correct answer. In supraglottic swallowing, what is done is, that the patient will chew the food. After chewing the food, the patient keeps the food in the mouth, is not going to swallow. Then he takes a deep breath from the nose and he holds the breath, holds the breath and then he will exhale, breathe out. So breathing out and swallowing are done together. Patient is chew, breathe, and then swallow and breathe out together. So swallowing is the act the food is going in, breathing out, the air is going out of the larynx. So the, because the air is going out of the larynx, the food cannot go. It will not allow the food to go to the larynx. The food can only go to the hypopharynx and the esophagus. So this is called supraglottic swallowing. It's trained to the patient who has undergone horizontal laryngectomy, not in total laryngectomy. Right. Again, a simple question, straightforward actually. A 60-year-old female comes with a history of discharge. <coughs> Uh, and nasal bleeding since one month. She also complains of weight loss and fatigue and CT scan is shown possible diagnosis. Now angiofibroma is straight well ruled out because of the age. Angiofibroma is seen in juvenile age group, juvenile males, right? Now any of the three can have this history that is given there. 60 years, discharge, bleeding, fatigue, weight loss can happen to any of the three. So all the three are possible answers. Now angiofibroma, nasophageal carcinoma is either it's bimodal spread, either it is seen in 20 years age or between 30 to 50 years of age. This is the age group where nasophageal carcinoma is more commonly seen. In 60 years, nasophageal carcinoma is very uncommon. Moreover, if you look at the CT scan, it's a big tumor, but it's confined to the nasal cavity. It is not broken through the bones. It is not spread out of the nasal cavity, despite the fact that it's a big tumor. Now, this is a classical character of a benign tumor. Malignant tumors 
will spread out of the bones and the cartilage. There will be widespread involvement if it's such a big tumor. So this is most likely to be a benign tumor. Nasophageal carcinoma is a malignant tumor. So two reasons why it is not nasophageal carcinoma. A, the tumor is confined to the nose only. There is no spread outside the nose. And the age is not matching. So this is ruled out. And esthesia is also a malignant tumor. Same reason, esthesia neuroblastoma is like, less likely to be a diagnosis because uh, the CT scan is suggestive of a benign tumor. The only benign tumor in this list is the inverted papilloma. So B is your best answer in this case. Now I'll show you the CT scan. See, the first image is showing you how the angiofibroma, inverted papilloma, benign tumor looks like. Look at the second one. This is esthesia neuroblastoma. Esthesia neuroblastoma is a tumor of the olfactory epithelium which is seen in the roof of the nose and that's why it goes to the nose to the cranial cavity also as is shown. It's a malignant tumor. It will always spread to the cranial cavity like this one. So this CT scan shows it's a malignant tumor, not a benign tumor. And look at the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Again, it has broken through the boundaries of the uh, nasopharynx into the nose and other areas. And even in the brain, it's going into the brain also in this area as if you see. Right. So the CT scan says it's a benign tumor. The only benign tumor in that list was inverted papilloma. Next one. This was a, again CT scan of the PNS. And they asked you to identify the given anomaly. If you look, most of the thing in the CT scan is normal. The only anomal thing is this uh, arrow which is pointing. This is a pneumatized middle terminate. This is a middle terminate. There is air inside. And pneumatized middle terminate is called concha bullosa. Okay, so this is concha bullosa. Uh, Honored cell is a cell of the ethmoid near optic nerve. Is a cell near optic nerve. And I'll show you what is paradox. And superior turbinate pneumatization is usually not seen. It's a very small thing. You can't see such a big thing. Because superior turbinate is a very, very small turbinate. I'm sure you know this. Right. See, this is onodicil. cell. This is onodicil, cell. And this is onodicil. cell. This is how the onodicil cells looks like. This is agar cell, most anti model cell. And this is the one that I've shown you, conca bullosa. What is the meaning of paradoxical turbinate. Now look at the lower image, middle turbinate. If you look at this turbinate, it is pointing laterally, but this turbinate is pointing medially. Now turbinate should point laterally. You see inferior turbinate is curved laterally. This also curved laterally. Both are normal, inferior turbinate. But look at the middle turbinate. One is curved laterally, which is normal. One is curved medially, which is abnormal. This abnormal curve of the turbinate is called paradoxical middle turbinate. Right, it can also cause obstruction and sinusitis. So look at the middle turbinate; they are all in the same direction. Look at the inferior turbinate; they are opposite; they are curved opposite direction. That's the right thing. They cannot be in the same direction like the middle one. So that's the one of them is abnormal. That is called paradoxical turbinate. Okay, what is the treatment of bilateral corneal atresia? If both the canal is blocked, atresia means both the canal is blocked. The child cannot hear. Right. So initial treatment. Is it bone anchored hearing aid, piston? Piston is used for stapedectomy. It's used for autosclerosis. Cochlear implant is used for bilateral SNHL. Canal atresia will cause CHL. For CHL, we never use a cochlear implant. Cochlear damage causes SNHL. And vestibular implant is not for hearing. Vestibular implant is not used. There is nothing called vestibular implant, actually. We don't have vestibular implants. Right. So obviously the correct answer is bone anchored hearing aid in this case. You know what? When the child has bilateral corneal atresia, there is a possibility of hearing loss and speech defect. This child is called deaf mute child. What do you call it? Deaf mute child. No hearing. No. If you can't hear, you can't, can't speak. Now, after a certain time, hearing can improve with hearing aids and cochlear implants and other things, you can improve the hearing aid. But after a certain, say, four or five years, if you don't correct the child's speech, the speech can never come back. It is very difficult to give back the speech or train speech in a child who has not spoken for up to five years, six years of age. So the main thing when the child is deaf-mute, cannot hear, cannot speak, that you must fix the hearing 
so that the child can hear the sound and then develop the speech. So the plan is that initially we give bilateral bone anchored hearing aid till five years, right? So this is the answer in that question. But this is not going to remain forever. After five years, we'll do canal apply. We repair the canal and open the canal. This is the whole plan in this patient. Now, why is canaloplasty not done in the beginning? Why do we first give a hearing aid, bone anchored hearing aid, and then after five years, we do canaloplasty? Because in a newborn child, the canal is not developed. And any bony structure which is not developed, we don't repair it till it is developed. So, canal completes the development at around four to five years of age. So, we wait till then. And after the child has completed four, five years of age, the canal is completely developed. Then we do canaloplasty. That's our main aim. But till then what? Till then you have to go with bone anchored hearing aid. That's the plan. Right. Then we go. This Now we have two or three questions which are very straightforward. Direct question, nothing. How do you measure the length, how much length of the uh, NG tube, nasogastric tubes to be used? And you just have to know that from nose tip to the lobule till the GP sternum. So this is your correct answer. That from nose to the lobule to the GP sternum. So this must be the length of the uh, NG tube and this is the image showing how to measure see from the tip of the nose to the lobule to the GF sternum so you have to use this length NG tube it's a very straightforward thing you just have to know this then in uh, 2001 May uh, July they had asked very straightforward question like this image and straight away you know the diagnosis there is another question on adenoid faces this is also adenoid faces right so what are the features of adenoid faces IR's palette Prominent or crowded upper teeth, pinched nose or collapsed ella, hyperblack semisla, and dull expression. In one of the questions where the adenoidectomy and grommet was the treatment, two things were given: high arch palate and crowded teeth. So these two told me it is adenoid phases. That's why we were doing adenoidectomy in that patient. Remember? Now another interesting question. Again, straightforward. Nothing uh, conceptually. It's a direct factual based questions. That which of the following is not a major criteria for uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. Nasal polyposis, fungal culture positivity, uh, CT scan finding characteristic or allergic mucin in the nose. <clears throat> this is a very tricky question actually speaking. I'll tell you why. Uh, the correct answer is fungal cultures, culture. Culture is the right word. Now this criteria was given by a person called Bent and Kuhn. And they gave two criteria, major criteria and minor criteria. The question was, which is not a major criteria, right? Polyp is there in the major criteria. CT scan finding is characteristic in that criteria. And isnophilic mucin, allergic mucin. But fungal culture is a minor criteria. So this was the odd man out. One of the, one of the choices was fungal culture, positive fungal culture. Positive fungal culture is not a major criteria, it's a minor criteria. However, fungal stain is a major criteria. So this is why we get trapped. Fungal stain is a positive, uh, major criteria, but fungal culture is a minor criteria for allergic fungal sinusitis. So this was the, the trick they had used in this patient. Right. Then a six-year-old child with recurrent attacks of tonsillitis underwent tonsillectomy. Post-op period was uneventful. On the next day, the patient was bleeding from the oral cavity, which is the following structure is responsible for bleeding. So, what is the most likely site of bleeding in tonsil patient is the peritonsil plexus of veins. So, venous bleed is the most likely source of bleeding. Usually, uh, we tie the vein, ligation, and the ligation slips, and that causes reaction. This is reactionary bleeding. What type of bleeding? Next day bleeding is reactionary bleeding and this is due to slippage of ligature and ligature is usually applied to which vessel to the peritonsillar vein it's a venous bleed that happens in tonsillectomy not so much the arterial bleed okay then which of the uh, what is the most common salivary gland tumor which is the straightforward this is discussed in pathology, in surgery, in ENT, and you just have to know that pyomophy adenoma is the most common tumor of the salivary gland. 
they might just trick you by using which of the following is the most common malignant tumor of this salivary gland. Any idea which is the most common malignant tumor of the salivary gland? Then mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Most common malignant tumor is mucoepidermoid carcinoma, but overall is pleomorphic adenoma, which is a benign tumor. Right. Now, uh, this year in the NEET PG exam, there was an image based question on parotid tumor. There are two or three questions based on parotid swelling and parotid tumor. One of the image based questions that shown the swelling in the parotid area and that asked the likely diagnosis and one of the choices is parotid tumor. So that was the correct answer. Parotid tumor. Okay. Next one. Uh, which is the feature of complication of chronic otitis media? Delta sign. With the following are features of complications of chronic otitis. So chronic otitis media will cause complication and they will cause some features. So which of the following is the feature of complication of chronic otitis media? So what are your answers, guys and girls? Delta sign, gray singer sign, battle sign, basalt abscess. Delta sign and gray singer sign are both seen in lateral sinus thrombosis. And lateral sinus thrombosis is a complication of chronic otitis media. So both these signs can be seen. Basal sign is basal abscess is absent in the sternocleidomastoid abscess, which is due to mastoiditis. And mastoiditis is a complication of otitis CSOM. So this can happen. Battle sign is a blue skin on the mastoid. Is a blue colored skin on the mastoid. This is fracture of skull base. And fracture of skull base is a trauma. It's not a complication of uh, CSUM. So 1, 2 and 4 are the correct answer. And that's why D, as you are rightly saying, is the correct answer. So many of you have answered D. I think everybody, Arindam, Yamali, Pooja, Prats, they are all correct. D is very straightforward. A delta sign is a CT scan finding where this area which is thrombosed area looks like a delta. Delta is the area where the sea meets the uh, river meets the sea. When the river meets the sea, the river is bringing a lot of uh, sand. It deposits the sand at the mouth of the river where it's meeting the sea and it creates a V-shaped area in that area that's called delta. <clears throat> so delta sign you can see this area which is this area delta. This is basalt abscess. Basalt abscess, abscess of sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle going. This is abscess here. Basalt abscess. And this is a battle sign, which is a blue skin over the mastoid. And this is due to fracture of the skull base, which is not a complication of CSU. So it was not a difficult question. But this battle sign has been asked a uh, few times in the last few years. So remember this. All these are very commonly used terms. <clears throat> now comes a question which everybody will know. And they ask you this question so, so commonly is this X-ray finding. The radiograph shown below is done for the better assessment of the frontal sinus. What view is this? They ask you Waters view, Cardwell's view, Race view, Pierre's view. All these views are asked so commonly in the exam. And I'm pretty sure that you know all how to identify every view that is given here. This particular, there are two, uh, two uh, hints. One, the image is a hint. And second hint is the fact that it is done for frontal sinus. So last to last year in NEAT PG, they asked which other, the question was, uh, which is the X-ray view done, uh, uh, Cardwell's view is done for which sinus? Cardwell's view is done for frontal sinus. And in this, they had given an image of Cardwell's view. This is a Cardwell's view. Uh, obviously, if it is frontal sinus, it has to be Cardwell. Even if you don't know how to identify X-rays, frontal sinus, the term will give you the lead to this particular question. Right, Cardwell's view. <clears throat> then, see, the first, image shows you this is called occipital mental view. This is how the occipital mental view is done. And this is a view which leads to either Waters view or Pierre's view. In Pierre's view, the mouth is open. In Waters view, the mouth is closed. Others both are occipital mental view. They are mainly done for maxilla. And Pierre's, in addition to maxilla, also shows you the sphenoid. They are not done for frontal sinus. So frontal sinus, we all know we do Cardwell's view. 
this is a ray view ray view is mainly for orbit so they discuss i'm sure in ophthalmology in more details orbit and sphere orbital fission and all this you can see but along with that you can see some parts of the ethmoids also if you want to see ethmoid properly then you can see the these are the ethmoids sinuses these are all ethmoid area you can see ethmoid sinuses in the ray view it's not very commonly done in ENT, it is done mainly in ophthalmology, the ray Then, this is a patient, uh, of DNS, so they give him the hint, and identify the marked, arrow marked structure, this is the area arrow here, and it's very straightforward, this structure is the inferior turbinate. It might have been difficult if the image is very close up image. So, but middle turbinate looks very easy. This is the middle. Okay, look at this. Uh, this is the inferior turbinate. This is the middle turbinate and this is the septum. These are the three things that you can see in this image nicely. Inferior turbinate, middle turbinate and the septum. So again, simple question. You just either you know it or you don't know it. There is nothing that you can explain. A very similar question. See, the third question in this, in just in the last three years, is have been asked on the same topic. That's why I keep telling you this is such an important topic. Which of the following are the objective tests for hearing? Vera, autocoustic emission, autonomy, or tympanometry? And you know the answer so well now. This is subjective. Rest are all objective. So one, two, and four are objective. One, two, and four. Straightforward. This out and out anatomy question, but still doesn't matter. That they've put an arrow. This is a, uh, image of the sphenoid sinus. You can mainly see the greater wing of the sphenoid. The these are the greater wings of the sphenoid. You can see the lesser wing, and these are the pterygoids. Medial and lateral pterygoids can be seen. And this is the sinus here, sphenoid sinus openings. And they are asking about this particular foramen. It's a very popular foramen in the sphenoid bone through which the maxillary nerve travels. And this is a foramen rotunda. The, uh, the maxillary nerve enters the sphenoplatin foramen through this sphenoplatin fossa through this foramen, foramen rotunda. Now look at these uh, scans, you can see uh, they are both sphenoid, one from the anterior view, one from the posterior view. Now I, as I said, these are the lesser wings and these are the greater wings and this is the body of the sphenoid, these are the pterygoids, right. <clears throat> now this is the foramen they were talking about, foramen rotundum. This is the optic canal and this is the superior orbital fissure, you can see this from the back. So this is the optic canal, superior orbital fissure and foramen rotundum. Three openings you can see from this view. Look at the other view where you can see the greater wing properly but not the lesser wing so much. It is, But between the two you can see this uh, this one, superior orbital fissure. These are the sinuses, I told you. Now this is the foramen rotundum and this is the pterygoid canal. These are the foramen rotundum and this is the pterygoid canal through which the Vidian nerve enters the same area. Foramen retendum and pterygoid canal, from both this area, different nerves enter and they go to the same area, they go to the pterygoid fossa. I told you foramen retendum, the maxillary nerve travels and the pterygoid canal, obviously nerve of the pterygoid canal. Which is the nerve of the pterygoid canal? The vidian nerve that travels. And they all ultimately going to the nose to supply the sensory supply and the parasympathetic supply to the nose. <coughs> this another image, so you can see this is more colorful. So I told you this is the optic canal. This one is superior orbital fissure. This is the foramen rotundum. And this one is oval. This is spinosum. In this, you cannot see the pterygoid canal. Pterygoid canal you can see from the other side. So various foramen that you must be able to identify. But I'm sure in anatomy, in general anatomy, they discuss this in greater details with you. This is not an ENT question actually. Okay, the following can be presenting symptom of COVID. Very simple. Is it, is it throat, throat, fever, 
cough, anosmia, loss of sense of smell, and loss of taste, sense of taste, agusia. And everybody will know all are features of COVID. COVID can have fever, sore throat. These are some of the commonest presentation. Cough can happen when it goes lower down. And a lot of people had loss of sense of smell, anosmia, and the loss of taste sensation also, agusia. <coughs> so all, one, two, three, four, all of them is the correct answer. Right. So these were the questions of ENT that were asked in the last few years in initiate exam. So the takeaway is that hearing tests are very, very important. Auditory pathways is a very common topic. X-rays of the PNSs, they ask you commonly. And CSOM, they will ask indirectly question in some ways. Carcinomas, tumors of larynx, hypopharynx, nasopharynx, and benign tumor like angiofibroma. Also, not only about the tumors, but also the presentations, their treatment. Also, a bit about staging, a little bit of staging, if you know, and the treatment based on the staging, that will help. So, these are some of the types of questions they ask you <clears throat> in initial exam. So, I hope that this session was useful, guys. And uh, as we say, that if you have any doubts, you can contact us on any platform that you wish to, because our main aim is to help you hold your hands and walk you through your exams. That's what we are here for. So anything that you need, just we are one call away, right? I wish you all the best. God bless you. And I really hope that uh, you've done very well in your need piece exam and you'll do equally good for your um, initiate exam. Bye-bye and thank you.